What if the most important number in your hormone labs isn't actually estradiol for women? We get asked this all the time. What are the optimal levels for hormones like estrogen during and after menopause, specifically when it comes to bone health? Most people expect that the answer is going to center entirely on estradiol, but here's the surprising truth. Estradiol doesn't tell the whole story. Let's talk about a biomarker that can be measured right alongside estrogen and estradiol, but is often ignored. And this one's called FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone. As women go through perimenopause and menopause, FSH levels will start to rise as estrogen levels become inconsistent, as they become erratic, and as they start to fall as women go through menopause. We know that elevated FSH levels are associated with low bone density, but this is often thought, and I honestly thought this until recently, to be due to the low levels of estrogen that the FSH secretion is responding to. They are part of the same cycle. Evidence is building up, though, that FSH may actually play an independent role in bone health. So that means it's not just necessarily a reflection of low estrogen. Maybe FSH is actually doing something to the bones, and therefore we should be paying more attention to it. So researchers have seen this in studies. So you can see in studies that FSH is, again, inversely associated with bone mineral density. What does that mean? It means FSH goes up, bone mineral density goes down. So one example study is on 675 postmenopausal women, and again, they found that higher FSH correlated with lower bone mineral density at the femoral neck, that's the hip, as well as in the spine. But the important thing here is this was even after adjusting for estradiol levels and other variables. So in other words, FSH wasn't just a mirror of falling estrogen, it added unique information about bone risk. And there's other studies that show this too, including NHANES data. And these studies show, a, again, a nonlinear relationship where increases in FSH beyond a threshold are tied to higher risk of osteoporosis. And this is in absence of, or when adjusted for, estrogen levels. So mechanistically, FSH shows that it can independently activate osteoclasts. So these are the cells that break down bone. So the higher the level of FSH, the more osteoclast function. And again, this makes sense because we know the same is true on the other side. As estrogen levels fall, we know that osteoclast function is going to increase as well, but it might not be just about the estrogen. So estradiol is foundational for bone, for sure, but FSH actually seems to have its own individual impact on what's happening in the bone metabolism story. So let's dig in a little bit deeper with the estradiol and FSH together, because ultimately you want to know, what should I be measuring? What level should I be looking for, right? So estradiol could appear normal while FSH is already climbing. We see this in perimenopause all the time, right? A woman is not quite 12 months out from her last cycle, but yet her FSH is already high. This is one of the tools we can use to help women to predict, kind of, how close they are to actually seeing the end of their menstrual cycles. But you can see this elevation in FSH while estradiol levels are still quote unquote normal, of course, depending on the day that you measure it. And that means if you're only measuring estradiol or not measuring anything at all, you can miss these early hormonal signals of bone loss. So let's talk about measuring for a second, because again, there are many physicians who are refusing to run any labs at all for perimenopause and menopausal women. And even actually openly criticizing me for even talking about it, not necessarily practicing this way. I think it's time we move past this dogma of HRT without labs for women. I mean, consider how we do it for men. We're actually required to use labs for TRT for men, but we're not even allowed to consider them for women. I don't understand it. The irony, the cognitive dissonance of all of the, the physicians who are out here saying that the way that we are practicing by doing labs is harming women or that we're pushing some kind of narrative that is just for our own income, I think is ridiculous when you consider the idea that we have to do this for men and there's so much benefit, especially for bones, if you make sure that the hormones that you're providing are hitting the thresholds that we know that we need to hit to have the impact that we want to have. It's not all about symptom management when it comes to hormone optimization. Sorry to interrupt this lab-driven conversation around FSH, but if you are looking for the top five levers that we see people using or more accurately failing to use appropriately on their bone health journey, come to our masterclass where we talk about these top five mistakes that we see over and over again. 
because of our YouTube channel, our other social media, our osteo collective community, and our clinical practice, we see thousands of people on bone health journeys. And I do see the same mistakes over and over and over again. So if you'd like to learn what those are so we can time collapse your time to success, just look for the link in the description on YouTube. Or if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can just go to our website, osteocollective.com. So then let's talk about these labs. So Amstradiol, I do like measuring in blood. This is a baseline hormonal status. I wanna know like how well are you absorbing what we're providing, depending on how you're getting it through patch or through cream or whatever it is. I wanna know how much is getting in your bloodstream, right? This is helpful. FSH then can detect what's happening at the brain and at the cellular level in the body. So FSH is giving us feedback on what's happening with the estradiol as it's coming in. How much estradiol you need is going to be dependent on what your cells are telling your brain and what your brain is telling your body. CTX and P1MP then, as the bone turnover markers I talk about frequently, are going to also be helpful here because we know that as estradiol reaches a certain threshold where your cells can actually see it, FSH reaches a certain threshold where your brain is happy with the amount of estradiol that your cells are seeing, we're going to see an impact at the cellular level of bone. That means that osteoclasts are going to slow down, CTX is going to fall, and P1MP is going to rise. That's ultimately what we're looking for. We also want to test for androgens. I want to know what's happening with your total, your free testosterone, and your DHEA, because androgens matter too, even in women. And this is, again, totally overlooked. And again, this is one of these really, I mean, it's sad, really, but one of these things where I hear so many doctors say, don't test hormones, don't test hormones. And my question to them is, well, how am I going to know if a woman would benefit from androgens if I don't know what her androgen levels are? What if she has symptoms that are consistent with low thyroid, with menopause, with perimenopause, you know, with low testosterone, but also with poor lifestyle choices, all these things that can come together? If we don't test for androgen levels, how am I going to know if this is potentially a lever that we can pull for treatment or not? You want me to just guess? Again, I don't get it. Why would we require testing for men and say that it's bad for women? I do not understand. Somebody please explain that to me. And then lastly, on this hormone panel, of course, we want to use a progesterone serum lab because I want to know what's happening with the progesterone. If a woman is taking it, is she getting adequate progesterone to protect her uterus and other tissues around the body? And progesterone is also beneficial for tissues in the body other than the uterus. It actually is protective of the brain, protective of the arteries, and it even serves a role in bone. So together, these provide a much clearer picture of bone health and the treatment response. This is especially important when we're fine-tuning hormone replacement therapy. This is the concept of hormone optimization. Because I have seen this over and over again, where even for doctors that measure, if they're using an arbitrary number for estradiol, let's say it's 60 picogram per ml. If you're saying that this is my threshold and I want you to get to 60 and you get there on a particular you know, strength route, dose, whatever of estradiol, but your FSH is still high, then you're probably not having the impact that you think you're having on bone. Whether or not it's coming from estradiol or it's coming from FSH, we don't really know. But if you're not looking at FSH, if you're not looking at the bone turnover markers, you are going to then have to wait for imaging studies like a DEXA every two years or longer to know if you're having the impact that you want to have. And that interval is too long. Now, for all of you doctors out there that don't like measuring FSH and you've looked at the research, I get it because not all of the research supports exactly what I'm saying. There are some studies that show that FSH does not have an independent impact on bone, but I think there is enough evidence here. And clinically, this is what I see very clearly is that if FSH remains high, then estradiol levels are not optimized. So the takeaway here is this, when patients ask, what are my optimal estrogen levels? The answer is, it depends. We need the whole picture. We need to understand what's happening with estradiol, with FSH, with the bone turnover markers. I also want to know what's going on with your thyroid. I want to know what's happening with your androgens. That's how we move from simply managing menopause symptoms, menopausal hormone therapy, MHT, to truly optimizing long-term health with what I would call hormone replacement therapy. So that's it on this one. I just wanted to put more information out there, give you some citations to look up FSH on your own. And please remember that life should be about honoring your health, making memories, and aging with strength and grace. I'll see you in the next video.